So, I'm not as well prepared as I hoped to be. They, they, they all said, you have to speak, you have to speak, it's your conference. So, I wrote this two days ago. And uh, my PowerPoint I was going to do last night, but I was up to half one doing the wonderful one we saw this morning, so which is completely worthwhile. So I'm going to have this whole talk just with a picture of Tim Curry from Legend. <laughs> that's, that, that's it. That's all I've got. And it's actually relevant, but um, it's the only slide I've got. But what a slide to have. Okay. So uh, this being trans states as well, I. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to do something I've never done before because that's what trans states is all about. So I'm going to begin with a short piece of creative writing. Uh, I'm a screenwriter, so this is a short scene that I've ever so slightly tweaked um, so that I can quite literally set the scene. So, interior tent night. We're inside an old-fashioned ridge tent, large and dark, lit by torch and lamplight. The mildew-stained canvas and heavy wooden poles billow and shake, betraying the cold night wind. Also seen hanging up amongst the lamps and torches are scarves and woggles. This is a Cub Scout camp. A group of eight young boys between the ages of eight and ten, wrapped up in their sleeping bags, are huddled around each other, talking excitedly with strong Northern Irish accents. One particularly chubby boy with dirty blonde hair, Cavan, sits a meter or two apart from the others. He looks terrified. We all saw it, says one boy. It did look like a hoof print, interjects another. That's why they call it Devil's Rock, adds a third. Made by the devil's own hoof, clarifies the first boy. That's right, the know-it-all rallies. They told me the devil was chasing someone and who? A new voice. It doesn't matter. A bad man, asks the doubter. It doesn't matter, know-it-all continues, but whoever it, whoever it was made, so whoever it was made him really angry because he was thundering through the forest at a terrific speed. The boy has his audience captive now. Cavan still sits some distance away, looking like he wants to speak, but is instead near paralyzed with fear. He ran so fast that when he came out of the trees at the top of the waterfall, there was no time to stop. Instead, he jumped straight off the top and landed on a rock at the bottom, then kept running. But it's so far down, the doubter again. We know he was here, explains the first boy, a believer, because when he landed, he left his hoof print deep in the rock. The night howls louder and Cavan's eyes begin to dart around the tent, still in abject terror, looking suspiciously at the shadows dancing in, on the tent's canvas walls. Why did it leave a print, though, on a rock? Because he's the devil, came the obvious answer. Because it was such a huge jump, came another less convincing one. The know-it-all seeks to clear everything up. Yes, it was far, and don't forget, the devil burns with the fires of hell himself. When he landed, his hoof melted right into the rock, and that's why it left such a deep mark. Silence falls for a moment. That remark seems to have closed the matter. One boy, unspoken until this point, breaks the silence. Does anyone want any crisps? My ma gave me a whole load of them. The boys clamber in to get the late night tuck. Cavan is still staring, transfixed at some shadows on the wall. The folds in the fabric look vaguely like the pointed fingers of a claw. Suddenly the canvas ripples and the shadow moves. In one fell swoop, Cavan jumps out of his skin and straight out of the tent altogether. Exterior, campsite, night. Outside, Cavan is sprinting for his life in that way that only truly terrified people can. Across a field and into a neighboring forest, he hurtles himself into the shelter of a tree looking around for just a second, then a dark wood? He clearly registers his situation is worse rather than better. Vulnerable and shivering, he curls up and clutches his legs, clamps his eyes firmly shut, and starts manically reciting at incredible speed barely audible, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, our Father. Fade to, Cavan, still clasping, clasping his knees, asleep under the tree, resting against the trunk, daylight is starting to creep in, and he begins to stir. So I begin this presentation then with a prologue, a dramatic device that is employed to introduce characters, 
often the protagonist of a story and relay something about them integral to the subsequent narrative. Rather notably, the protagonist depicted in this tale is myself. The scene recounted is actually as close as I could get, recollection permitting, and I am of course aware of the very real existence of false memories. It is as actually as close as I could get to the memory of a formative real life event from my youth. Though I accept certain details could have evolved, emerged, or embellished over time, this memory is crystal clear to me because it is a psychological scar. This and other related incidents traumatized me. I genuinely felt my life was in immediate danger from the supernatural entity and villain extraordinaire, the devil. Though it is recounted with some bashfulness now, I still recall the absolute genuine terror that I felt at the time. And so this now explains the image up here because I also watched this film when I was 11 and so damaged was I by my, my, my upbringing that this gave me night terrors for two solid weeks. Okay, so to be clear, I'm not putting this forward as evidence against Christianity aspects, just saying, it bears, it bears, it's worth saying, aspects of which I still have great affection for, nor simply Catholicism, Maybe Irish Catholicism comes closer to my object of criticism, but that's still overly simplistic. It does, however, highlight for me the very real trauma caused by codified structural oppression. To give another very brief example, failing in one's duty to attend mass is a mortal sin. In Catholic theology, a mortal sin is a gravely sinful act which condemns one to the damnation of hellfire if one does not repent the sin before death. So. For Catholics, this has to be done during the sacrament of holy confession. Now, from a very young age, the horrors and tortures of hell were depicted for us in excruciating detail. I was not alone in recounting stories of having missed mass for some reason beyond our control, which in fact undermines it as a mortal sin, um, but we didn't understand the delicacies of this moral theology at about seven or eight years of age. And if I'm totally honest, the uh, priests didn't really explain it to us that successfully either. So having missed mass by an accident of circumstance or even at the order of a parent, which you'll note to not follow would be breaking a commandment, I have memories of walking to school utterly terrified that if I accidentally got hit by a car or some other misfortune before the next opportunity to attend confession, I would spend an eternity in torture and damnation. This is real stuff. This, this is my childhood. I worked out so well, though. Now, this is a fairly extreme example. Not all narrative structures of our codified culture are so plainly problematic. They maintain cohesion, direction, and social order, and have a part to play in our evolutionary development. But it is important to cast a critical eye on the extent of serious trauma that has arisen from many of these socially sanctioned narratives. Blake's mind-forged manacles do not only imprison one within our own interior landscape, but our now hyper-networked society's language systems entrap us in a culturally constructed discursive environment. Whether knowingly or in ignorance, our codified culture and those who author it can wield narrativity like a double-edged technology to liberate and to heal or to beget bondage and trauma. The power of authorship then hangs heavy above us all like a great sword of Damocles. Revisionary myth-making, the form of rewriting that this presentation is concerned with, is about reclaiming that power and when faced with oppressive and harmful narratives, flipping the script. Some here have heard me discussing narrative self and narrative identity before, uh, and the idea that not only do stories constitute the cultural fabric within which we're embedded, we are stories. As Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience Anil Seth suggests, we are an, quote, integrated network of processes that distinguish self from non-self at many different levels, end quote. We are a complex of different selves, one of which is the narrative self. Clinical psychologist Lloyd Globerman argues that, quote, in a very literal sense, we are stories. The narrative that is our personal history is the very essence of who we are. Seth describes the narrative self as, quote, where the I comes in. It is the experience of being a continuous and distinctive person over time. This narrative self, the story we tell ourselves about who we are, is built from a rich set of autobiographical memories, end quote. It is also, as Foucault and Cassels point out, composed of discursive correspondences within one's wider social networks. 
societal network, sorry. In infancy, we do not yet have the capacity for long-term memory, but as this powerful and transformative neurophysiological mechanism emerges, we begin to experience our life worlds as story, a story that is, as Seth phrases it, built. Stories, like selves, are structured, constructed, and culturally mediated. Returning briefly to Globerman, he argues as a clinician that, quote, figuratively speaking, successful living is being able to have script control over our life story, end quote. Globerman is not talking about some kind of magical power to control all of the circumstances of one's life, but rather that one can therapeutically harness authorial control of one's narrative self. Each of us, as stories in themselves, storytellers, and the participants in the exchange and consumption of st shared stories at a societal level has this power and arguably responsibility of authorship. Furthermore, the entanglement and interrelationality between oneself and one's environment can certainly make the harnessing of such authorial power provoke consequences so profound and unexpected that they seem all too magical. So I do not just write for the screen, I am a scholar also, and scholars write not just to disseminate research, but as a method of research in itself. Academic writing is not only a practice in structuring, formulating, and evidencing an argument, it also fosters a rich understanding of one's own thoughts on a given subject. Good writing requires rewriting, and rewriting requires critical reflection. Writing is credited with a great many utilities as a tool of cultural production, education, and creativity, as a method of education, dissemination, inquiry, and research, as a form of therapy, and even the means to reveal oneself, to show oneself through the act of self-writing. See Foucault. Professor Kreipel, one of our esteemed keynotes, go so far as to argue that the very act of writing itself can become a paranormal practice, wherein individuals can literally, or perhaps that should be literarily, author the impossible. Interestingly, Kreipel notes that a key ingredient that individuals require to become authors of the impossible is radical reflexivity. Highly reflexive individuals engage in self-writing, they are actors rather than reactors in the structuring of their narrative selves. And such a process is both transformative and liber liberatory from the codified structures and mental prisons within which they are embedded and to which they are bonded. How then is the act of revision distinguished from its unhyphenated sibling? The hyphenated version of this term concept was introduced in 1972 by feminist poet and theorist Adrienne Rich in her seminal essay, When We Dead Awaken, writing as revision. Rich famously wrote, revision, the act of looking back, of seeing with fresh eyes or entering an old text from a new critical direction is for us, women, more than a chapter in cultural history. It is an act of survival a radical critique of how we have been living, how we have been led to imagine ourselves, how our language has trapped us as well as liberated us, and how we can begin to see and therefore live afresh. We need to know the writing of the past and know it differently than we have ever known it, not to pass on a tradition, but to break its hold over us. Revision is correcting making a newer, improved, amended version. Revision, on the other hand, is a purposeful, critical engagement through new eyes as a new self, unfettered, or at least less fettered, by the limitations inherent in the language systems and cultural matrix that housed the previous self. This new sight has the power to bring about that which is not yet visible and not yet communicable. It is, in its way, a form of revelation. No wonder that Kreipel identifies reflexivity as a key attribute for those who aim to author the impossible. The link to revision is clear. The revisionist must believe nothing impossible. All forms of oppression must ultimately be framed as surmountable, for without such hope and a method of introducing new and liberated future possibilities, how are the oppressed to endure their myriad forms of traumatic suffering? And not just the avoidance of suffering, but revision as an act of survival because self-determination affords autonomy, 
from the otherwise perpetually adverse circumstances of pre-existing oppressive cultural narratives. Revision of self and culture gives us new eyes to see what textual elements of our cultural history constrain us more than enable us. Now very, very briefly to myth-making. Uh, myth is as clear an example of a term that defies sharp delineation as any. It's used across many different fields of study in many different contexts. Although I have in fact written about my usage of the term at some length, time is the enemy here. So if you're interested in those ideas, I promise I will expand on them elsewhere. But in short, myth-making is world-making. Myth-making forms part of the codification and organizing structure by which in large part our life worlds are formulated because we must employ institutions, heuristics, and working models in order to engage in the world at all. Myth-making can, knowingly or unknowingly, produce forms of codified structural oppression. oppression. Revisionary myth-making is the emancipatory, revisionist form of self and world-making. Emancipation follows from the expose of relativistic, socially sanctioned, monolithic accounts of inflexible reality and truth as the mythological constructs that they really are, stories that can in fact be revisioned and rewritten. For example, the religious mythology that the young Cub Scout cavern was under the spell of due to its presentation as a universal truth has subsequently been revealed has subsequently been revealed, hang on, as one amongst a vast plurality of cultural stories, and in being so revealed, liberated me from the traumatic fear and behavioral restrictions that the symbol of Satan and the punishment of eternal hellfire imposed on me. I'm now free to rewrite a totally new relationality to this mythology that can be personally and socially transformative rather than stunting and traumatic. Revisionary myth-making is the recodifying of culture by reflexively rewriting the past within the cultural field of the present in novel ways that demand active and radically critical re-readings that disrupt and break through existing societal and cultural programming, and in doing so, creating new possibilities for the future. At its best, it is a form of self and cultural engineering. Okay, have I got one minute? I've just got, okay. As a creative practitioner, I'm keen on bookending as a stylistic approach, and I do this in the majority, if not all, of my films, and so I want to do just that in this presentation by ending with a piece of creative writing that I feel directly speaks to these ideas, and indeed all the ideas that I've been discussing over the last couple of years. In the spirit of revision and reflexivity, I retraced my way through my personal journals and was struck by this excerpt from May 2017 titled, This Is Your Story. Reading it now, this piece of primarily automatic writing, although it contains bricolage of pre-existing cultural ideas, there's some song lyrics, some quotes, some names of texts, and so on, the material also seems to be somewhat of a foreshadowing or a seed, because in it, all of these ideas that I would later espouse, even the ones that I had not yet researched, were there all along. So this is the, this is the journal entry. This is your story. You are the master that makes the gra gr grass green, the lord of this world, Yeshua Shaitan, Thoth Hermes. You are a stranger in a strange land, a dark body floating in darkness, a shining body in a company of stars, a hero, a monster, nemesis, apotheosis, adversary, redeemer, all you, all one, liberator and dominator, Chains of bondage and cybernetic extension, engineering forth and holding fast. Language, technology, words, signs, symbols, and magic. Narratives, myths, and stories. All stories within the one story, the overstory. And all of it lies. Because the truth cannot be told, only revealed, only known, grokked, directly experienced. It cannot be communicated because it is a unity, and all stories are communicated, mediated, translated. All stories are contracts, laws, promises, dreams, possible worlds and programs of thought, form, and being. But their reconstruction chains us to structures new as they liberate us from old. Our lives are made up of the contracts we have made, the stories we subscribe to, and the ideas we hold dear, and hold us more dearly still. 
These contracts negotiate and bind up our identities, map out our reality tunnels and our life worlds. Our subjective and consensus realities, our culture, built up story after story, contract after contract, line after line of code. This is your story, written in blood. Thank you very much. That was all totally clear then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do what? Well, but, I mean, I feel that I was blessed. Sorry, I feel that I was blessed because I was a different person. And I think some people are blessed to just walk around the world and go, but why though? You know, just constantly. Yeah, but, but huh? I don't, why? So I was very fortunate to be one of those people. So, you know, um, I don't know why some people are very fortunate to be some of those people from as early as they can remember. I say fortunate, obviously it, it has its problems as well. But I, to, to pe some people just don't even consider this as a concept, you know? They just don't even, they're not even aware of it. But this is why I'm banging this drum. I, I, I sincerely be believe that we're talking about sort of technologies of being and, and ways of approaching and understanding the world that are liberatory for people. And why I keep talking about it is that maybe some of those people that haven't even thought about it might give it a go. And in my own personal journey, um, it, the, the, the processes that I began, which I, I talked about recently at some length, w were in order for me to get over a really deep clinical depression. And I actually um, just experimented um, with my use of language as a way of coping with the, the, the problem because I noticed how being really negative and talking about myself in a really negative way was, was making it worse. So I just started changing my thought processes and the words that I said, and it completely transformed not just me, but the people around me. And then, so that's what sent me down this rabbit hole and seeing the power of, 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 of taking this authorial control. Um, uh, uh, and, and so that, that's been my journey. And I, everything I'm doing at the minute is just shouting this from the rooftops, saying to people, just give this a go, see what happens, you know? It doesn't, you know, and trying to maybe uh, not disenchant it, but make people realize that although it's extraordinary, this is a very ordinary process and accessible to everyone. So I, I, I think why some people are, I, I couldn't speculate, you know. I, I, I don't want to because it can get into difficult binaries of like awake, asleep, and all of these things which are deeply problematic. But you know, certainly I remember the difference between walking around this world being impacted by all of the, the, the language and signage and advertising and sort of just taking it on passively compared to where I am now where I immediately see the structure behind it and I immediately see the fabrication, the way it was made and it has a totally different relationship with me and a complete lack of power. Um, I wish that point of view for everyone. Is it on? Okay, thank you. A um, few thoughts bouncing around my head. You spoke about the about myth making potentially becoming a new oppressive structure. Yeah, yeah. So there are a few things in regard to that. Um, most recently, I saw an advertisement that showed a reformulation of Jordowski's The Holy Mountain mm. to sell uh, outerwear. And the Messiah was Dennis Rodman. So, yeah. so it was pretty scary to me to see that. Do you have anything to say about the way esoteric ideas are being incorporated into mainstream culture and, and how it's serving advertising or other nefarious purposes? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's new. I think everybody knows that the practice of advertising is definitely using, not knowingly necessarily using these esoteric technologies, but it certainly is using them 
if by another name. Um, and, and there's absolutely nothing, nothing new about that. Yeah. So, do you uh, think it's unknowing? Do you think? No, not not entirely. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I think some 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 people will be doing it knowingly, um, and it you know it it certainly does appear to be more visible at this time. You know, whether there is an all cultural renaissance or not, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Um, it does appear to be more visible. Um, but that's why we have to show people behind the curtain, you know? If, if there's, you know, if there's, I don't really get into a good, bad magic is another false dichotomy, but if there is bad magic, then it is advertising, for sure, <laughs> for, for sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's why I think it's really helpful. There's different ways, that, different language systems that we can use to talk about this, and they all have their own currency and their own value. And I think being able to talk about it in, in a way where it can be understood maybe as a technology um, uh, and then ha and, and deconstruct what is being done by some people that are, are willfully using it for unhelpful ends given the ecological crisis that we're facing, um, yes, I think it's incumbent upon people that see it for what it is to, to do that to some extent. And, and, I, and I think some differences in... Uh, because there's a place for being the magician and like wearing robes and all of that, you know? You know, if you want to create a situation where you actually have, uh, uh, for example, make contact with a, a, an Enochian angel or, you know, that, then, then the robes and all of that shenanigans really helps, you know? It does. But uh, there are other situations where it helps to um, use a different register and a different form of language maybe to help, to help others sort of see the extent to which they're being manipulated. Um, I, I, I always talk about the, just the title, you know Douglas Rushkoff's book, Programmer Be Programmed? Just in that title, okay? If you're not programming actively yourself and the world around you, then someone else is doing it to you. Or as Terence McKenna said, you know, if you don't have a pa plan, you're part of somebody else's plan. That one fact, just getting people to wake up to that and just look more around them with a critical eye about, about how they are being oppressed by the, by the code around them, the, co the codified structural oppression. Yeah, I think it's valuable. That's pretty much that's all we've it. got time Wrapping for. Up. Time's up. Okay, I'm thank afraid. you, everyone. Thank you.